Amen. GBC, welcome. You may be seated. Little ones, children, get out of here. It is a fam jam weekend, and kids' life is in the back waiting on you. Go hear about Jesus in a language that is all your own. Welcome, GBC. My name is Cameron. I'm one of the pastors here. Happy summer. It's almost over. My gosh. Some of you are excited. Some of you are not about that. If you have your Bibles, you can start hunting down the book of Esther. It's a tricky book to find. Here's the best way to do it. Open your Bible in the middle. Smack dab in the middle. You're going to end up somewhere near Psalms. Start heading towards the left. Book of Esther is right after or before, forgive me, before the book of Job. Esther, we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning. Finally, finally meeting our heroine, the star of the show, Esther. But she's not really the star of the show, as we've been saying all along. She's not the star, neither is Mordecai. God is the star. God is the hero of the story of Esther. He's the one true king seated on his throne, working through his quiet and silent and hidden providence. And hiddenness is one of the great themes of the entire book of Esther. Not only here in chapter 2 is Esther going to hide or conceal her Jewish identity from the king. There's this also just so happened that wouldn't have been lost on the Jewish readers of this story. You see, Esther, when spoken in the Hebrew language, Esther, sounds very much like the Hebrew word for hide, conceal me, it's a fair. That wouldn't have been lost on the Jewish readers. And the book is full of little things like that. The author, who's also hidden, by the way, the author's anonymous. We don't know who he or she is. The author writes this story in such a way that guess who else is hidden? God. He's not mentioned one time in the entire story. He's not mentioned once. There is no God. There is no mention of God. There is no prayer. There is no worship. There is no temple. There is no sacrifice. There's no religion other than the worship of a pagan king. Now, this wasn't just some oversight on the part of the author as if they got done writing it like, oh gosh, I forgot to put God into the story. No, this was a very deliberate literary effect that the author did, inviting us to read the story in such a way that we are looking, looking for God's activity. And it's all over the place. Because the entire story is written in such a way that there are these just so happens and these coincidences and these, and these kind of plot reversals that there's no other way that that could have happened but God. I mean, even at one point in the story, it's almost as if the author has to try to not mention God. At one point in the story, Mordecai fasts. And he covers himself in sackcloth and ash, but there's no mention of prayer. And Jews did not fast and do the whole sackcloth and ash thing without prayer. And yet, there's no mention of prayer. Again, this, this is a genius literary device. The author is inviting us to look for God. Which reminds us that Esther is really about God being at work. In all the ways, at all times, behind the scenes, and often silent and hidden ways which is also true for those of us who belong to Jesus. That God is always, always, always moving in our lives, often in silent, seemingly hidden ways. Which is why one of the big takeaways and lessons we learn from the book of Esther is that God really can be trusted even when he can't be seen. Even when it doesn't seem that his care and his concern for us is evident the heart of the book of Esther is about God doing what he has always done preserving and protecting his people that they might be a witness for his namesake and he does this work in the book of Esther through seemingly insignificant people Mordecai the Jew and Esther his cousin but before we you turn me down just a little bit Thanks, Pat. But before we meet our girl, Esther, this morning, I, I want to give you the big takeaway, okay? 
Because we're about to get lost in the details of the story, and I don't want you to lose our big takeaway. If you're a note taker, here is your cue. Here's the takeaway. There is great hope for the compromised among us. There is great hope for the compromised among us. Now, do me a favor. Stop looking around as if you're trying to figure out who I'm talking about. Because I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. Last week, Dustin introduced us to Mordecai, a Jew who is in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. Loaded statement, chapter 2, verse 5. He is a, he's a Jew, but he's not in Jerusalem. He's in Susa, but not the city. He's in the citadel, the apex of political power and culture creating. His name, even Mordecai, is a name that gave honor to the pagan god Marduk. For all intents and purposes, Mordecai is a guy who is compromised, living in the world and being all about the world. This morning we get to meet Esther, Hadassah, who, guess what, prepare your hearts, like it or not, there are a few things about our girl that you probably did not pick up by watching the movie One Night with the King. Let's pick up the story. Esther 2, verse 7. I want you to meet Hadassah. He, Mordecai, was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther. Hadassah is her Jewish name. It means myrtle. Purity symbolizes peace and joy. Myrtle was carried around in processions in jars. It also has this idea of righteousness tied to Zechariah chapter 1. Hadassah is her Jewish name, also known as Esther. I already told you her name has this idea of hiddenness in it, but you know what else Esther means? It means star. And it's got a derivative nature from the pagan goddess Ishtar, the goddess of love and war. Both Mordecai, both Esther, their names honor pagan gods. Verse 7, let's keep going. She was the daughter of his uncle Mordecai, for she had neither father nor mother, so she's an orphan. And the young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. She's the complete package, and that's going to come into play soon. Mordecai took her as his own daughter. He adopted her, which meant in that culture, she would have submitted to his advice and his counsel. Specifically in that culture, she would have done what he said. And we see that play out in the story. For her father and mother had died. Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So here we meet Esther. Hadassah, the girl with two names. She was a Jewish girl, late teens, early 20s, it's believed. And she is about to be thrust into the center of both political and palace intrigue. She belongs to God. She's a Jewish woman. She's about to belong also to the Persian king. She's an orphan. Mordecai has taken her in as his own. And she is lovely to Look at. No surprise then that she would be included in the pool that was fished for the new queen. You remember what's going on here, right? Okay, for those of you who weren't here last week or the week before, the king is looking for a new queen. Why? Because he banished the last one. Because in chapter 1, she would not come and parade herself in front of the entire kingdom. Many scholars believe that the king wanted to parade her wearing only her crown. Yeah, that's the kind of king we're dealing with. Let, let me introduce you to him. His name is Ahasuerus. I don't know if I did that right. Um, for those Harry Potter fans in the house, it sounds a bit like parcel tongue. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a couple fans. Good news is he also goes by his Greek name Xerxes, and that's where we're going to hang out. Xerxes lived for his own glory. He was a glory hound. His name, his fame, his way, his pleasure. Xerxes made decisions that fed his ego and his appetite. 
And both by chapter 2, his ego and his appetite had cost him dearly. Last week, Dustin explained if you were here, and if you weren't, please go listen to the message. It is foundational for the rest of this series, gbc.life. Click the sermons button. But last week, Dustin explained that between chapter 1 and chapter 2, Xerxes went to war with Greece, only it did not go well for him. He lost decisively and definitively the battle at Thermopylae first, the battle at Salamis second, then the battle at Plataea third. Total rabbit trail, but we're talking about actual historical events. This is, this is awesome. This is God infiltrating human history and the comings and goings of mere mortals in order to move his redemptive story forward. These are real battles. Look them up. I don't just want you to read the Bible. I want you to immerse yourself into the story and see that this is God at work in and through human history. Rabbit trail over. Chapter 2, verse 1, Xerxes is back home licking his wounds. He is depressed. He is dejected. He is defeated. His army has been decimated. His war chest is empty. His ego is badly bruised, and he is still without a queen. This is Xerxes. This is the king whose appetite for his own glory cost him dearly. Chapter 2, verse 1, let's read. After these things, what things? Lost his queen and he lost on the battlefield. After these things, when the anger of the king had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So here's the king. He's depressed. He's frustrated. He is down in the dumps. Have you ever been there? I'm sure you have. But have you ever made a really dumb decision when you have been there? Because that's how the next four verses play out here. Xerxes down in the dumps. He begins thinking about Vashti. He begins thinking about what happened to her, what was decreed against her, as if he did not have a major role in that. And it is clear that he's at a low point in his career. So what does he do? Oh, I don't know. Let's listen to the young men who attend him. They've got a bright idea. Verse 2. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. Sought out. (laughs) Let's read, taken, captured, assimilated, conscripted, captured. Let young, beautiful virgins be taken for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all these beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Higai, the king's eunuch who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them. Let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king and he did so. Folks, this is really bad counsel. And once again, like chapter 1, we find the king taking counsel from those who guide him according to his gratification, not his ultimate good. Let me say that again. The king is taking counsel that feeds his flesh, that does not fuel his faith, that does not have his ultimate good in mind. Which begs the question, who do you seek counsel from? Who do you invite into your life to speak wise words to you when you come up against a wall and you don't know how to go forward? Who are you asking for your godly options at a crossroads in your life? See, the king asked his attendants, what do I do? And and here's, here's the truth of the matter. When we are in this place, when we are depressed and dejected and low, we are susceptible to really bad counsel. That's why we need people who will speak the truth to us who will speak the truth in love to us, who love us enough but aren't impressed by us, to be honest with us, who will push back on what we want, who are more concerned with our holiness than our happiness. Who do you go to for counsel? And does their counsel fuel your flesh or your faith? Because this plan right here, folks, it seeks, it reeks of something devised in a locker room. And yet it works. It works because whatever pain Xerxes felt for Vashti, they were quickly replaced as his lust ignites afresh. And this is where the story starts to take a a darker turn. 
because the empire goes to work, starts rounding up all of the young, the beautiful, the virgins, including Esther. Let's keep going. Verse 8. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. Josephus, the Jewish historian, puts the pool of young virgins around 400. 400 young women lined up one a night. In search for the right one, the new Vashti, the anti-Vashti, meaning the one who would never again defy the king. Ladies, uh, imagine this if you can. Okay, th there you are. You've got your number. You're 263 out of 400. You've got your date set on the calendar for your one night with the king. And, and please, let's not, let's not sanitize this, Okay. I see children in here, we're going to do our best to be honest and um, censored, uh, but, but we don't want to sensitize the reality of this story. And so if you want to take your children over to kids life, that would be a great idea right now. This isn't a Cinderella story in which the majority of these women were lining up, excited to take a shot to become the king. No, 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 no. These girls were being taken. They were being kidnapped, exploited as objects of sexual slavery solely for the satisfaction of the king. This is one of the largest and most vile sex trafficking events in history. So what, what was it like? Let's keep going. Verse 12. Take a look. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Xerxes, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, I didn't know that was a word, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. This is believed that she could take different types of clothing or different instruments in case she wanted to dance or sing for the king or different aphrodisiacal foods or whatever. Use your imagination. Keep going. Verse 14. In the evening, she'd go in. And in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. In the evening, they would go in. And in the morning, they'd go to the second harem, a different place than the first, it's believed. In other words, their new home. Remember, once a woman had slept with the king, her fate was sealed. She could never be with another man. She could never have a family of her own. She could never have children unless the king decided to make her one of his wives, not the queen, but one who would give him children. She'd never be able to leave the palace, leave the harem. And she'd only ever expect to see the king if he delighted in her, if he called her by name. There was no date here, folks. There was no long walk on the beach. There was no conversation over dinner, so tell me about yourself. What are your hobbies, your favorite Netflix show? No, when, when did she go in? Bedtime. When did she leave? In the morning. Before the sun came up, get dressed and go. He's like a lot of guys. Let me sleep with you, and then I'll figure out if I want to get to know you. And as a father, I shudder at the idea of my daughter needing to perform in bed in order to win the approval of a man as an object of lust or a tool of desire. And how many men treat women like that today? I don't want to know her. I don't want to date her. I don't want to love her. I don't want to marry her. I want her to show up at night, leave in the morning. Don't call me. Don't text me. Don't email me. And if I want to get to know you, I'll call. The empire is still alive and well. A whole year these girls were preparing. There's a line, 400 women deep. Every night for 400 nights, if you please the king, you are crowned Miss Persia. And if not, you live in a nice room at the palace. Your life is plush but pointless. And as a father of a daughter, I just, Mordecai, come on, man. Are you serious? You didn't protect her. You sent her. 
Of course he's concerned. Verse 11 tells us that he goes to the gate of the court to find out what he can every single day. But he does nothing to protect her. I don't know what I would have done. Daz, what would you have done? Smuggled your girl out on a camel? Put up a fight? I don't know. Perhaps Mordecai just didn't have a choice. Perhaps he was just doing the best that he can. And here's an interesting thing about the story. The author never weighs in on the morality of a decision, on the ethics of a choice. The author only states the facts. It's an interesting observation for us. But what do we do? What do we do with decisions like this in Mordecai's life, in Mordecai's world? He lets her go, watching her go away to what's probably a life of imprisonment where she will be a plaything among hundreds and hundreds of other defenseless young women. What would you have done, Dad? Ladies, what, what, what would you have done if you were in Esther's shoes? What would you have done when, she got to the, when you got to the palace? What does Esther do when she gets to the palace? I'm glad you asked because here's where the movies get it wrong, okay? Here, here's what we know. All of the language up to this point surrounding Esther's captivity is entirely passive, Okay, you following? That means that everything that happened to her up to this point happened to her. She had no choices. She was like a reed being blown by the wind of the decisions of other people like Xerxes, like Mordecai. But hear me, once she got to the palace, she was anything but passive. Listen, this, this may not sit well with some of us. Our beloved Esther and while it is true that Esther is the victim of one of the most vile and largest sex trafficking events in history, once she got to the palace, the author wants us to know that she put forth great effort to not only survive, but to thrive. Verse 8, the king's edict goes out. Verse 8, the girls are gathered and brought in. Verse 8, they all submit to the custody of Haggai. What does verse 9 tell us? Look at verse 9. And the young woman, speaking of Esther, pleased him, Haggai, and won his favor. Now, what did it mean for her to win his favor? He quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven young maids from the palace. And he advanced her to the best place in the house. The force of this is not on the types of gifts. It's the speed in which she received them. But here's, here's where it gets murky and muddy. That phrase, one favor, it's, it's an unusual phrase in the Hebrew language. It's not a very flattering phrase because it tells us that Esther didn't just stumble into this favor. She won favor. She applied herself diligently. She worked for her promotion in the house of women by fitting into the agenda of the empire. She didn't simply find favor. She won it. She became whatever she needed to in order to keep hope alive. She's pliable. She's flexible. She's moldable. That's what the phrase suggests in the Hebrew language. As I started studying that, that started to make me very uncomfortable thought she was the hero or or was she just doing the best that she could in a really really awful situation once again the author he doesn't comment on the ethics on the seeming compromise look at look at verse 15 when the turn came for Esther to go into the king she asked for nothing except what Haggai the king's eunuch told her now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. She knew what she was doing, folks. She was not only extraordinarily beautiful, she was calculatingly wise. One of the rabbinical commentaries on Esther says that she was, she was like a work of art in which every beholder could see exactly what they wanted. Her skill was to find favor in the eyes of all that looked upon her. So here, here she is, Hadassah a Jew, 
yet Esther the Persian, the girl with two names. She's called to live a distinct life, obedient to the laws of Judaism. She belongs to God, but she doesn't show it publicly. She says she belongs to God, but she is disobeying the dietary laws in the word of God. She says she belongs to God, but she lives far away from him. She says she belongs to God, but at this point in the story, we've never seen her pray, open her Bible, worship God, repent of sin. There's no indication that she has any relationship with God whatsoever. How, how many of us are like that? Kind of Christian, but kind of not Christian. Kind of obedient, kind of not obedient, sort of following the scriptures, but sort of not following the scriptures. Privately believing in God, but publicly nobody knows. You know what the scriptures tell you to do. You don't do what the scriptures tell you to do. When asked, you check the Christian box but the evidence would not hold up in court. You're just kind of going along with the flow of the culture around you, doing what you have to do to get by. How many of you is this your story? You say, you know, that, that kind of sounds like my story. Here, here's the deal, folks. Esther is a complicated character. So is Mordecai. So are you. And so am I. And for someone like Esther, who has only ever known captivity, remember, she has only ever grown up in Persia, in exile, it is hard to not imagine that the pull of life in the Persian court wouldn't in some ways be desirable, but maybe, maybe Esther is just doing the best that she can. And like Mordecai, the author doesn't condemn her actions nor celebrate them doesn't critique nor applaud them. What are we supposed to do with this? How do we interpret these things? Well, hold on to those questions because Esther's turn is here. Her one night with the king has arrived. It's her turn. The tension is mounting, right? Esther's in the harem. She's at the spa. She's got her number. She's in line. Her one night with the king is here. What will she do? What do you think she should do? Verse 16. Let's keep moving forward. I know some of y'all are mad at me right now. Verse 16. And when Esther was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign, Tibet is around December, January, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and Favor. There's that phrase again, she won favor, but there's grace also. God's at work. We can't see it. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't smell like it. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all of the other virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. She won. Esther won. And what was the result? Verse 18. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. What else did he do? He granted a remission of taxes to the provinces. He gave great gifts with royal generosity. There's a queen. Everyone's happy now, right? She won. Is this good news or bad news? Yes, perhaps both. Because there is a long line of collateral damage on the way to that second harem. This is a victory, but it's a tragic one. And, 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 and here's an important question for us to grapple with. Was Esther always a godly woman? What do we do with this long list of, of questionable choices and compromises our heroine has made? We have a couple options in front of us, okay? Two at least that I can tell. I'm sure that there are more, but here are the two options that I can see. Yes, yes, option one. Esther is a godly woman. She's always been one. She is amazing from beginning to end. She has never faltered, no, not once. And yet even a cursory reading of the story seems to blow that option out of the water. But then we watch movies like One Night with the King. And I'm, I'm not trying to knock it. I am all for us putting forth great effort to create artistic expressions that communicate biblical stories. But goodness, guys, that movie kind of paints Esther as this perfect super Jew. She's memorized the whole Old Testament. She's doing Bible studies with the concubines. She's never missed a quiet time yet. 
In the movie, when it comes her turn to be with the king, it's kind of like it never happened, but she kind of had a dream slash fantasy where it maybe happened, we don't really know. And, 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 and then she decides to kind of be like the Virgin Mary up until her wedding night and hold off. And the king's so in love with her that he's stiff arm and other women that are still trying to show up in line. And I'm just like, stop it. But why do we tell a story like that? Look, if you checked out, check back in. There is this tragic way of reading the Bible that suggests there are good people and bad people. And God loves the good people and he hates the bad people. And he uses the good people and he doesn't use the bad people. And Esther was used by God. Obviously, she must be a good person. And if that is true, then we are all in trouble. And... We have to jettison most of the Bible characters we know and love. I mean, we love Jacob and Noah. They're heroes. Yet one was a swindler and one was a drunk. We love Joseph. Oh, man, he had such a rotten go of it. And yet we forget how quickly he assimilated into Egypt and the shame that he at first heaped upon his brothers. We forget that Joseph was the very first slave in Egypt. And by the end of his life, his entire family is in Egypt and they become slaves for 400 years. I I know what you're thinking. Hold on, Cameron. Come on. There are good people in the Bible. What about David? David was a man after God's own heart. Yana, another man's wife. And he killed that man to keep the wife. You don't even have to be a Christian to say, well, that's, that's not right. Here's the point. Bible characters are complex. And even their legacies are decidedly mixed. Mordecai, Esther, you, me, we are complex creatures. Yes, Esther was the victim of a tyrant. Yet she proved herself as excellent in living a Persian life and preparing for the king's bed. And no, God doesn't just love good people and use good people. No, God loves sinful humanity and the wicked and the compromised and the grimy among us. He extends grace to us and he uses us for his purposes. No, I I don't think personally that Esther was a godly person throughout the whole story, but God still used her. And in the process of using her, he changed her her and began to transform her heart and her mind and remind her who she was and whose she was. Church, there is great hope for the compromised among us, which brings us to option two, which I think is much more probable, which is really what we've been saying all along. Esther is not some flat character who is consistent throughout the whole story. Haman, who we'll meet next week, he's a flat character. He's one-dimensional. He's evil through and through. Xerxes, one-dimensional, flat character, but not Esther, not Mordecai. And something happens to them in the story, folks, where a light bulb goes off and they remember who they are. They begin to see what God sees, that God really is control, in control, and he really does have a plan and a purpose for them right where they are Ah, No, I'm not entirely sure that Esther was a godly woman, her whole story. But there is growth, there is change, there is progress, there is sanctification. And this means that there is hope for all of us. How many of you, your story is like Esther's? No, not the specifics. But yeah, I've, I've, I've broken some commandments. I've slept with somebody who wasn't my spouse or somebody's. I've hidden my Christian faith. I've compromised to look good on paper. I've fudged the numbers in order to increase my bottom line. I've, I've kept a foot in both worlds. I have been inconsistent. Here's the deal, church. So have I. So have I. I've blown it. I've made poor choices. I have believed lies and lived in ways that are contrary to who I am in Christ. And like Esther... I have come to meet Esther's God who introduced profound change in my life. 
who gave me a new heart and a new mind and a new past and a new present and a new future, who forgave all of my iniquities and my inconsistencies and took my sinful nature and gave me a godly, divine nature and who started to transform my desires and my hungers and my appetites and my attitudes. That's the power of the gospel. Church, God's people are not perfect, but his plans are. And if our imperfections disqualified us from being used by God, None of us would ever, ever, ever be used. But the good news of the gospel, friends, is that God is not looking for perfect servants. He already sent one. And through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our past compromises don't have to disqualify us from contending for God's future and the future that God wants to do in and through us. Let me say that again. Because of who Christ is and what he has done and what he longs and desires to do in and through us, our past does not need to own our future. God's not done with us. So, 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 so where do we go from here? See, the hardest part about this message is I just get to tell you what happened. But there's a, there's a principle to be seen in the midst of this. That we have work to do. No matter what baggage you brought in here or what compromise you're currently living in, there is a way forward for us. The, the Apostle Paul helps us here. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, we're going to drop into the middle of a thought, but this, this is our way forward. You don't need to turn there, but make a note. This is what the Apostle Paul tells to the Christians in Philippi and to you and to I. This is where we go forward. Paul writes, Philippians 3 verse 13, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says one thing I do. There is a singular focus now for this man of God. And what is that singular focus? Forgetting what lies behind. Folks, where do, where do we move forward here? We need to practice some biblical forgetting. And no, Paul did not get some spiritual amnesia where he forgot everything that ever happened to him before. No, no, no. What he's saying is that forgetting lies in not letting our past name us any longer. Biblical forgetting is all about no longer allowing our past to identify us any longer, naming us any longer, but allowing the God who redeems us and gives us a new name to call us by that new name. And this doesn't, of course, eliminate the natural consequences that come from our choices, but what this is about is about learning to speak to the new man, the new woman in each of us. So many of us are so named by our past mistakes and past sins and past failures that we have disqualified ourselves from ever being used by God again. And God is saying, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm in the business of redemption and restoration. And when you can't see me or feel me, trust me. I'm moving and I'm working. Hear me, Mordecai. Are you listening, Esther? Esther? Forget what lies behind. Learn to allow our Heavenly Father to name us, not our past, not our failures, not our sins, not our compromises, but the fact that we have been clothed with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Stay tuned in this story because God is going to use Esther and Mordecai in powerful ways. And he wants to use you. For his purposes to be his witness for his name's sake. Praise be to God that God's not done with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and your goodness through us. Help us to know what biblical forgetting looks like. Not letting our past name us. Even our past from last night. For if we are in Christ, we are new creations. You give us a new name.
We are dead to sin and alive to God. Help us to believe that. And by virtue of believing that, begin to walk in the confidence of your life in us, equipping and empowering us to walk out the new life that is ours in Christ. We give you praise this morning in Jesus' name.